Well, good morning. It is good to be at church today, uh, even though the Braves were heartbreak last night. There's a few Braves fans in the room. Y'all didn't watch the game last night. It's okay. There are a few teams that we just don't speak of that I know that there are fans present uh, today, but it's good. Hey, I just want to welcome you. Uh, if this is your first time here, maybe it's been a while. My name's Josh. My wife, Brittany, and I uh, are the lead pastors here. And uh, as Brittany just said, we're wrapping up uh, our series today, Spirit Lead Me. And uh, it has been um, quite the series for us. And um, if this is your first time here, I, I would encourage you, um, I mean, hopefully this becomes home. And uh, we see God bringing so many people uh, into the Greenville area and have added. And it's always so encouraging to look around the room and realize when people have kind of come on this journey. Some people have been part of the church since they were babies. Uh, and then there are people that God just called you to Greenville. And you said yes. And this has become home. Uh, but if you haven't made that decision yet or if you missed the last couple of weeks, I would encourage you to go back. Um, even for me, I, I believe that, that the Holy Spirit has been speaking and leading in such a way like I'm looking forward to going back and watching through. Um, and I know that it may sound weird for you, but I, I just believe that there are moments that God's speaking and I want to make sure that I'm grabbing hold of everything he has uh, for me. And uh, this has not been a series, Spirit Lead Me, that uh, I look and say, well, all those church people ain't listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, so I better just tell them that they need to. Uh, we, we have been praying God's Spirit lead us uh, as individuals. Um, I, my prayer has been Holy Spirit lead our home, uh, Holy Spirit lead our church. And, uh, and so um, it, has, it has just been an incredible time. We, we wrapped up. Uh, 14 days of prayer yesterday, uh, and um, it was, I, I hate using the term wrap up, uh, because we just, we believe that, that we should be a church of prayer, that we should be people of prayer, and um, it, it, four years ago, my, my first uh, sermon series here as a church was to pray first, because I just believe that in everything we're doing, if we're not praying and seeking the voice of the Holy Spirit, and how fitting it is, we're coming up on four years serving as, as pastors here, um, that that word still rings true, that we're going to pray first. And we've had uh, just a mighty move uh, of God on Wednesday nights, on Saturday mornings. Um, we pray before every service, 8 a.m. It's an open invite. You want to come, be a part of pre-service prayer. It happens right at 8. It, it, walking in today and seeing groups of our church folks just gathering together, praying for each other, praying together, uh, and we're not done. So while the title 14 Days of Prayer may have finished up, because that would kind of be weird to say, hey, we're just continuing 14 Days of Prayer forever for the next 14 days and then another 14 days. Uh, we're going to continue to pray. And um, I, I do believe that God's got some stuff in store for us. We're just trying to take the right steps. And the Holy Spirit's been speaking to people in the church who are going to start gathering in homes. And they just said, Pastor, we feel like that, that we're supposed to gather in some homes and start praying. And, and, and there are already prayer small groups that have been happening. And, and we're looking to see how are we going to gather corporately to continue to pray and seek the face of God for what he wants to do. And um, I, I'll just tell you, I'm excited. I, I love giving plans and saying, hey, here's the 10-step plan of where we're going. Um, but I don't even need to know the 10 steps. I'm just praying, God, give me the next step. And let us not get ahead of your plan. Let us keep in step with you. And so I just want to pray. We're going to hop into God's Word. Uh, I got a lot for us today. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, just buckle up. Father, we just come to you right now. And we're so grateful so grateful that you are a good father. So grateful that you loved us so much you sent your son Jesus to pay the price for our sin and our mistakes. You sent your Holy Spirit to lead, to guide, to comfort us, to empower us. So God, I just pray that you would have your way in this place today. Stir our hearts, challenge us, speak to us. In your name we pray, amen. 
Uh, I say that I have a lot today because when I first uh, had, had slotted this series uh, on, on the calendar, um, I, I knew that uh, we were going to do a series and, and about the Holy Spirit, uh, and I really felt like this series was supposed to be about what it looks like to live a Spirit-filled life. That's really was the intent. When I, I pray through, I'm even praying through beginning of next year already, God, what do you have us to speak? Uh, and, and I love when God kind of pivots things because it really means that I'm releasing and allowing God to do what God does best. And uh, at the same time, I spend a lot of time in prayer when we're carving out series. And I think sometimes God gives me just enough to begin for me to make the right decisions to put in place. And then he, he, he fills the rest of the gap. And so this series was kind of one of those moments because I, I just believe that we're going to talk about what does it look like to be spirit-filled and live a spirit-filled life. And, and, and I really felt like the Holy Spirit pause us and just how can they live spirit-filled if they don't have an understanding of, of, of who the, the, the Holy Spirit is. And so we spent the last three weeks. In week one, Pastor uh, Tyler Still, one of our dear friends who's planting a church uh, in the upstate, he, he, he on that first opened the series and, and talked about the person of the Holy Spirit, the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Because I think sometimes when we don't quite understand something, our natural, our natural tendency is just to back away instead of leaning in to ask questions, to seek and to pursue. And then week two, we talked about the mission of the Holy Spirit. And the mission of the Holy Spirit is for everyone to know God. And I believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a, a, a second event that takes place after salvation, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone to empower us to live on mission. And then last week, we walked and journeyed all through Scripture to see God's presence and how God revealed himself in Scripture and, and God revealed himself in the Old Testament and then God revealed himself in Jesus in the New Testament and then God sent his Holy Spirit and how God has not stopped revealing himself. That God is with us. And so today, um, I'm going to try and preach the original series in, in one message. Uh, so we're going to talk about what it looks like to live a spirit-filled life. So that's why I said buckle up. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's going to be good. We're, we're, we're talking today um, because I believe that there's two components, uh, two attributes, two byproducts of living a spirit-filled life. And, 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 and we could get in and, and, and look at at a deeper level of what it really means to be spirit-filled and how do I, how do I know. Here's just what I would tell you. If you're ready to go on this journey of living a spirit-filled life, uh, a good prayer for you is spirit fill me up. I don't think it's complicated. I actually think it's very simple that if we're praying for more of the Holy Spirit, the byproduct of that is less of us and more of his spirit. And I believe when we pray that sincerely, that God answers those prayers. Seek first his kingdom and all of these things will be added unto you. But oftentimes in the, in the consumeristic society that we live in, we like to pick and choose what we want to add. So Holy Spirit, I want you, but I only want you in three, these three areas of my life. And can I have that gift, but not that gift? Because that gift's a little strange. And I really don't care for it. That, that may make me a little uncomfortable if, if that was the gift you sent my way. And then I think that there's just, when we're, when we're looking at these two components, it's really a spirit-filled life is a life that produces fruit. And a spirit-filled life is a life that receives gifts. There's the message for today. But we're going to dive deep into Scripture because I believe that sometimes when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we're looking at it in an unhealthy manner of things that we need to work on in our life. Of I need to love more, so i got to work harder to love more. I, I need to work on patience, so I'm going to work harder on, on, on my patience. 
I, I need to be kinder, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work harder on being kinder. But I want to tell you before we dive into this today that it's not working harder. It's leaning in and being led by the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit, I'm just going to tell you, we can't do it in our own power. We actually do a miserable job of it. And when I'm talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit, I'm not talking about how, how is the fruit of your life in private. Now, maybe self-control should be on that list in private, but I, I, I think when we look at the, the fruit of the Spirit, I'm not looking and saying, well, hey, how do you love people when you're in a, your apartment all by yourself? How, how, how's your patience doing when your kids are away at grandma's house? We can, we can actually have a false, false sense that we're doing better than we really are when we, when we evaluate the fruit of our life in the absence of people. Am I right? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Pastors, because when I look at my life, I'm probably a lot more fruitful when nobody else is around. But it's when you start dealing with people that we really have to start looking and evaluating how fruitful is your life. Now, Paul writes to the church of, of, of Galatia, and, and Galatians 5 is really where we, we find the fruit of the Spirit. But before we hop in, I need you to understand a little bit of the context of what's happening here in this moment, because the, the, the letter to the church of Galatia is written to a church that is at odds. Paul, Paul says this, and I, I'm, if you were here first service, you know I'm going, out of, I'm going a little bit out of order here. He found it necessary to warn the, the, the Galatians not. He, he said, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. He also warns, he says, don't become conceited, provoking and envying each other. The church in, in Galatia, the Galatians had become at odds with one another. So now when we read the fruit of the Spirit, Paul's saying, hey, when you're at odds with one another, how fruitful is your life? And he begins to, to pull this comparison and he talks about the things of the flesh and the things of the Spirit. And he says this, and I, I'm not going to my first, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping around, I just feel like I'm supposed to. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, he, he writes this. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Because here's what's happening in the church in Galatia is you have one group of people who say, hey, it's got to be the law. It's legalism. We're, we're grabbing hold of Moses' law, and this is the, this is the abiding, the, the bounds of my life. And if you understand when we say the law, it's not that in the New Testament we can stop, stop obeying the commands of God. Jesus fulfilled the law, and there's freedom in Jesus. It moves from looking at a task list and how we measure our life and saying, I'm looking to a relationship of the Savior of the universe who desires to walk with me, to talk with me, to lead every step of my life. And you had two groups in the church. You see, so you got this pocket of the Galatians here who say, hey, it's just, it's still the law because if you step outside of the law, well, we're going to indulge our flesh if we do that. Then you got this group from context that we would say, hey, I've, I've accepted the freedom of Jesus, but I'm indulging my flesh a little too much. And Paul says, regardless of where you are, the flesh and the spirit are at odds. We don't take this lightly because there is a war for your soul and your body. And Paul so clearly says, you're at war, be led by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. So our first point this morning, I got two points, but don't let that fool you. There's a lot in between them. <laughs> the first point is this, a Spirit-filled life keeps in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. 
But it's important to understand because in this in chapter five, where where we're we're just going to kind of rest for this first point today. Uh, it, It's not because we become more disciplined that we're able to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. It's not that we just get up a little earlier and we work harder. We try harder. Because that's not not leaning into the Holy Spirit. Now, I do believe when we lean into the Holy Spirit, our life, the byproduct, the fruit of that, becomes a fruitful life that is going to exhibit discipline and consistency and faithfulness to stay true to who God has created us to be. But one author said this, but here, but we see here also that one does not gain this life, talking about the fruits of the Spirit, by discipline or mustering up the energy. One does not huddle with oneself in the morning, gather together his or her forces, and charge onto the field of life full of self determined direction. Rather, the Christian life is a life of consistent surrender to the Spirit. If we are to stay in step with the Spirit, there has got to be a consistent and a constant commitment to surrender to the Spirit. So Paul continues in Galatians 5. He gets to the list of the works of the flesh and gets to the fruits of the Spirit. And we can use Paul's list as as an examination of where we are. It, it's not a, I, I don't want to discourage you, but I don't know of anybody in my life that is passing with flying colors at this moment. And I don't say that to demean or diminish the work of the Spirit. What I do say is I believe that this is a reflection that we are in constant need of more of the Spirit and less of our flesh. So if we use Paul's list and his fruit of the Spirit as, a, as a, a mandate of I've got to check off these boxes every day and I've got to work harder, it's this endless hamster wheel where we're not getting anywhere. Because every time we try a little harder, we're still not getting anywhere. But when we lean into the Spirit, the Spirit will lead us exactly where God wants us. And the fruit of that commitment and that life choice will be transformational. See, in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So I want to talk about them. I'm going to give you some characteristics of each of the fruit of the Spirit today. And so you can do your own self-evaluation of how well you're doing this morning. I don't know that there's as many people sat through two services today. You know, there's some of our dream teamers who do it. Probably, I'm out, Pastor. I had enough of that first service. So let's talk about love. Romans 5, 5 says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This changes us. All of these that I'm going to go through, for the sake of time, I'm not going to give all the scripture references. If you really love all that, you can ask. I'll email you my notes at any moment. We begin to put other, others' interests before our own. We find our hearts being knit together with people we once would have disregarded, judged, or even despised. Having felt the love of Christ, we can carry love with us wherever we go. Love compels us to work for the good of our brothers and our sisters. Love cares more about our brothers' spiritual welfare than our own spiritual freedom. No matter our position, we gladly consider ourselves as servants and are learning to ask not who will meet my needs today, but rather whose needs can I meet today? Better to carry even an ounce of this love than to enjoy all the world's wealth or comfort. For on the day when everything else passes away, love will remain. Love for God and others is the result of receiving God's perfect love. See, when we talk about love, God's love is absolutely perfect. He loved us before we loved him. 
Christ died for us while we were still sinners, while we were still separated because of the sin in our life. Christ said, I love you so much, I'm still going to give my life for you. And yet we get a situation twisted in our life and we can't love our neighbor. Somebody thinks differently than us and we can't love them. Love, lo, God's love is loving people right where they are and loving them so much that we don't want them to stay there. So love may be having hard conversations, but it's doing it in a manner because I understand that I love you so much that your eternity matters to me. That I'll be inconvenienced, I love you so much. I love you so much, I'll carve out time. I love you so much that I'll forgive you when you've wronged me. I love you so much. That the filling of the Holy Spirit, a spirit-filled life, is overflowing in the love that Christ has shown us. Joy. The joy of the Spirit is first and foremost joy in Jesus. Genuine joy in Christ overflows to everyone that is being made new. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, every week when we get to the salvation moment and we have a next step for people in the church, if you make that decision, we use the language you're made new. Why? Because Scripture talks about we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You want to know the fullness of joy? It's that moment when I said no to the past, no to where I was, and yes to Jesus. What I couldn't do in my own power, Jesus made a way. He gave his life. And when I reflect back, maybe you've been saved longer than I have. When I look back at who I was before I said yes to Jesus and received his forgiveness and salvation, when I look at that pivotal moment in my life, I experience nothing but the fullness of joy. Because I know that I was dead and gone in my own sin, but Jesus made a way. So when we talk about joy, the joy, the fullness of joy is found in Christ Jesus. That's the descriptor of joy. Christian joy is experiencing, I hate to even use the word happiness, but we all know it's, it's, it's happiness regardless of our circumstances. But it, it moves us back to this moment. Why can I experience joy regardless of how bad my life may feel today? How every door seems to be closing today? How everything feels like it's cramping inside of me? Because when I say yes to Jesus, I can find joy even in my darkest moments. Regardless of what the world may throw my way, I can experience fullness of joy. Peace. The biblical concept of peace is inclusive of life without conflict, as well as wholeness and harmony with God and others. See, the Holy Spirit's a great unifier of the church. No matter how different we may seem from the person in the seat beside us, in front of us, behind us, across the auditorium, when we become a part of the body of Christ, can I tell you that we share a body, we share a home, we share a sanctuary, all because we share the same Lord and one day we'll share the same heaven. There's peace. It's found in that. Peace is a result of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and our minds. When we have peace, we're removed from fear and worry about our finances, about our safety, about our salvation, about our, our eternity, because we can find that in Jesus and His Holy Spirit, we can experience peace. So, Pastor, are you telling me I shouldn't have any worries? Are you telling me I can't be fearful about stuff? I can tell you when you are full of the Holy Spirit, it minimizes our circumstances that we're in today. God, I don't have to be my provider because you are. God, I don't have to have all the answers because you've made a way. You've got the answers. You've ordered my steps. So yes, I do feel like we can find this place of peace and it's only found in the fullness of his spirit. Those who walk by the Spirit don't grieve Him by tearing down what He has built up. We see this in Ephesians 4. But rather pursue what makes for peace. So sometimes that means that we ask for forgiveness first, even when the majority of the fault lies with the other person. 
I'm not going to make eye contact. Because <laughs> sometimes I look around the room and be like, were you looking at me, Pastor? No, I was not. Unless the, that was the Holy Spirit just locking my eyes with you right now. <laughs> we hate all gossip. And instead honor our brothers and sisters behind their backs. When we must engage in conflict, we aim for restoration so that we might live in peace. Patience. As a fruit of the Spirit, patience is more than the ability to sit calmly in traffic or wait at the doctor's office well past your appointed time. If that's what we've minimized patience to, we're missing it. Translations, even the one I read today, use the word forbearance. But since this isn't a word that most of us commonly use, a lot of translations have replaced it with the word patience. But the Greek word here means long and passion. So through the Holy Spirit, we're able to wait longer before indulging our passions. We become long-tempered instead of short-tempered. Patience is the inner spiritual strength that enables us to receive an offense full in the face and then look right over it. Patient people are like God, slow to anger, even when confronted with severe and repeated frustration after frustration after frustration with difficult people, difficult people, difficult people. Patience. Patience is vital in discipleship. When Paul told Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season, he told him to do so with complete patience. See, ministry in the church, no matter what role that you may serve in and part you play, places us around people whose progress is much slower than we would like it to be. And instead of throwing our hands up, we must be patient with them all according to Scripture. Now, can I tell you I'm grateful for people that were full of the Holy Spirit who were patient when I was just a knucklehead? Who were patient when I wasn't making great decisions? Who were patient to say, I'm not giving up because I see the God in him. God's purpose and plan for him. And when we've been on the other side of somebody exuding patience in our life, shouldn't we be bearers of patience for those God has called us to be a part of discipling? Kindness. I'm just rolling. I'm doing a little better on time this service. It's one thing to receive an offense and walk away. It's another to receive an offense, repurpose it re in the factory of our soul, and send it back with a blessing. See, patience is just receiving the offense and being okay with it. I'll be patient with you. Lord's working on you. If not, I'm praying for him to do a work in you. And I'm going to walk away. Kindness is saying, hey, you just offended me, but you know what? I'm going to take that. I'm going to refashion it because God has been so kind and so gracious to me that in the fullness of the Spirit, because it's not in our flesh, our flesh doesn't take offenses and hurts and say, hey, I'm going to take this and I'm going to send a nice package back to you. Our flesh says, I'm going to get revenge. And if you cut me two inches, I'm coming with the, I'm, I'm going through you. I'm going to take you out. That's what our flesh says. But when we live a spirit-filled life, it is completely different. Kindness led by the Holy Spirit creates parents who discipline their children with a steady, tender voice. It's wives and husbands who repay their spouse's sharp words with a kiss. Do I need to rest there for a moment? <laughs> Kindness. It's not, hey, if you're coming at me with an eight or a nine in your voice tone, I'm going to come back over you in a ten. It says, hey, I understand that there may be some, some war going on in your life right now, and I'm just going to give you a big smooch on the lips. Husband and wives, can y'all try that the next time you get in an argument? Just, we'll just do some self-reporting here, you know? 
We're going to have a testimony time. Somebody declare the goodness of the Lord. Had that fight in last time, you know? All right, I got I, to I gotta keep going. I'm going to get off. Spirit, lead me. Goodness. People who walk by the Spirit carry with them a general disposition to be useful, to be generous, helpful. One describes it, this is, and I have to clarify this, this is when we don't need to be told to pitch in to help with the dishes. Or that the trash needs emptying. Husbands, pastor, but we get ready to work readily and with a good heart. Goodness is seen in our actions. The word relates to not only being good, but also doing good things. Charles Spurgeon said this, let us be on the watch for opportunities of usefulness. Let us go about the world with our our ears and eyes open, ready to avail ourselves of every occasion for doing good. Let us not be content till we are useful, but make this the main design and ambition for our lives. This was taken out of uh, the excerpt from Soul Winner. You want to reach people around you? May we be so full of the Holy Spirit that goodness exudes from our life. That we're constantly looking to how we can help, how we can be good, how we can serve others. Faithfulness. The faithfulness of God consists in part of his always doing what he says he will do. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. The faithfulness of God's people consists of us making every effort to do what we say we'll do. The faithful build such a trustworthy reputation that when they fail to follow through with something on their word, others don't say, well, you know him or you know her. They are surprised. Gentleness. In the King James Version, this was meekness. Seemed to be connected to weakness. I didn't realize this until I started to do some study. But it, it, was, it was connected with weakness, so the modern writers changed it to gentleness. And one of my Bible dictionaries says this. It says, meekness does not identify the weak, but more precisely the strong who have been placed in a position of weakness where they persevere without giving up. The use of the Greek word when applied to animals makes this clear, for it means tame when applied to wild animals. In other words, such animals have not lost their strength, but have learned to control the destructive instincts that prevent them from living in harmony with others. I don't even think I have to say anything else. Gentleness is being tame. Because if we give in to the flesh, we will devour everyone around us. You don't believe me, look at when you have some bad days and you don't lean into the spirit and you lean into your your feels. I don't feel like doing that today, Pastor. So I'm just going to tell them how I feel. That doesn't work out well for people. Self-control. Can I tell you that Scripture gives us no pretty pictures of self-control? Paul writes, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. He says, I discipline my body and keep it under control. The Greek word for discipline here means to give a black eye to strike in the face. (laughs) Paul's use is metaphorical, but the point still holds self-control hurts. And if it doesn't, you're not exhibiting enough self-control. Let's go back. There is a war that is fighting for, between our flesh and our soul. It is painful. It requires us to say no to any craving that draws us away from the spirit and into the flesh. But Jesus says in Matthew seven sixteen, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? 
How is your fruit? How in step are you with the Spirit? One writer said this, if we are abounding in these nine fruits, then we are walking by the Spirit. If these virtues are absent, then no spiritual gift can compensate for their lack. Spirit-filled life isn't just filled with gifts from the Spirit. It's got to be filled with fruit. I think if we're not careful, probably more so in Pentecostal churches, we can get so consumed with gifts, 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 gifts that we forget that God wants to do a work in us so that when he gives us the good gifts that he promises and has made available for all, it's not for our self-glorification. It's to bring glory and honor to God. So can I just talk a little bit just for a moment about the nature of God? God's not going to put gifts in our hands that we're not producing fruit that others look and say, well, that's not of God. Or if that is of God, I don't want anything to do with that. So if you found yourself pursuing gifts, but you're not pursuing a spirit-led life that's full of fruit, maybe, just maybe, you haven't gotten the answer because you're asking the wrong question. Spirit, fill me. Less of me, more of you. May my life produce good fruit. I don't know the last time you've been in a bad fruit, but it's not good. I don't even like apples that got little squishy spots on them. <laughs> See a banana getting too brown? Oh. Make banana bread or something with it. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? <laughs> it ain't. <laughs> A spirit-filled life produces good fruit. You know, Jesus in the New Testament, he curses the fig tree that isn't producing fruit. And I don't want to say, hey, if you're not living a fruit-filled life, Jesus is cursing you. Don't hear that today. But I do believe that we see such a strong lesson that it is vital for us to live a spirit-filled life that is full of fruit, and that's his desire for our life. And then lastly, this one's much shorter. A spiritful life desires the gifts of the Spirit. I don't believe that it is just for us to produce good fruit. I also believe that it is for us to embrace the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are available for us so that God is glorified. 1 Corinthians 14.1, Paul says this, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. Especially prophecy. See, the Spirit's not giving us these gifts for self-glorification. It is for glory to be brought to God. It's to elevate Christ. It's for, for Christ to be exalted. And Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and I just want to read this list because I, I, I just believe that sometimes when we're, let's say we've never studied, never dug into this passage and we're praying, okay, pastor told us to pray and eagerly seek the gifts and we begin to, I don't know the last time you opened uh, a toy, this happened the other day, uh, Cohen ha had a birthday party and he got a gift and, and the, the instructions came in a, in a different language. I couldn't figure that thing out. So what did I do? I had to go look at pictures. I went searching so I understood what the product was supposed to look like. I don't think that we're being good stewards if we just say, God, I want your gifts, but I don't even know what your gifts are. How will you recognize when he gives it to you? And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, or 4 through 11 here. He said, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And you know what that common good is? To elevate Jesus. To exalt God. And to one, there is given... Through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. 
to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Now, can I tell you, this is not the exhaustive list of spiritual gifts in Scripture. But it is a primary list and oftentimes the list that we would go to as a church to reveal and, and, and talk. And so I, I just want to, because here's what I do. Like, I hear a message of, of, of wisdom, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? How do I know the difference? And so here's what, what I've done. I did, I did a little dive, and I've just got a statement and a scripture reference for each one of these so that we can actually understand, oh, that's what that means. See, a message or a word of wisdom. This is the unique ability to speak forth the wisdom of God, especially in an important situation. We see this in, in Stephen's life and in Paul's life in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 23. And you know what? They were standing before government officials and God's Holy Spirit was so full in them that they began to speak wisdom. A message or a word of knowledge. This is the unique ability to declare knowledge that could only be revealed supernaturally. We see this in Jesus in Matthew 17, 24 to 27. Paul, Acts 27, 10, and 27, 23 through 26. See, the difference here is one may have great knowledge, even supernatural knowledge, yet not have the wisdom from God in the application of that knowledge. And I don't know if you've been on the receiving end of a word of knowledge, but sometimes that can be a little terrifying. How did you know that? I didn't say this last service, but I just want you to know, last year, Brittany and I, we had just kind of given, hey, it, it, Lord, if you want us to have another baby, we're just giving it to you. We're just giving it to you. We'll do our part. you got to do yours. And we kind of set a deadline of like, okay, at the end of the year, if you're not pregnant, then, then we'll, you know, whatever. And we had laid that before the Lord. We prayed. We sought counsel. Not because being fruitful is a bad thing. We just honestly felt like our kids are getting older. Is this like the right decision, you know? But we kind of like, ah, I don't know. God, we just give it to you. And it was a Sunday morning. Nobody knew, maybe some family members, that we were even praying through this. And on a Sunday morning, one of our church folks walked up and said, Hey, the Lord's given me a word. And this time next year, you'll be holding your baby. Well, Brittany was a mess. I'm a mess now because we're getting ready for Dawson to be here. This individual had no idea. And can I tell you, this is, and I just feel like this is to God be the glory because the date of conception was two days prior to that word being given to her. Now, if you don't believe in a God who loves us, in a God who has knit us together and has ordered our steps, I don't know that I can help you other than point you to everything that God's done in my life, I've continued to be amazed at God's faithfulness. That even a pastor sometimes needs to see the gifts of the Spirit exhibited in other folks to be reminded that God is still on the move and He's still speaking today. The gift of faith. This isn't just your basic belief. This is a spiritual gift of faith that... It's a unique ability to trust God under uh, all circumstances. We see this with Peter when he gets out of the boat. Jesus calls him out of the boat. Most of us, if we were in the boat and the storm's going on, Jesus is what we're so probably paralyzed from seeing Jesus walk to us on water that we're not hopping out of the boat. But, but I honestly believe that this is the exhibiting of the gift of faith. Healing. It's the power which it particular times we see all through scripture the apostles received from the Holy Spirit to cure diseases 
miraculous powers. Those seem to fit hand in hand, but miraculous powers literally means here an act of power describing when the Holy Spirit chooses to override the laws of nature. This is like a pilot grabbing hold of manual controls. Now here's the interesting thing. These these three gifts, faith, healing, and miraculous powers, oftentimes work in conjunction together. We see great faith, and we see God begin to move in gifting and healing and miraculous powers. Prophecy, the telling of God's message in a particular situation, always in accord with his word and his current work. Sometimes this comes and it will feel like a foretelling of the future, how it's exhibited. It's not limited to a a message, but I can tell you every Sunday I'm praying through that God would give a prophetic word for our church, that it wouldn't be my words, but it would be his words. But it's not limited to that. God's working and bringing prophecy to individuals, distinguishing between spirits. This is the ability to tell the difference between true and false doctrine, between what is of the spirit and what is not. Speaking different kinds of tongues. It's a personal language of prayer given by God whereby the believer can communicate with God beyond the limits of knowledge and understanding. When using the gift of tongues, we agree with God that as the Holy Spirit prays through us, though we may not understand what we are praying, God does. When tongues are practiced in the corporate life of the church, it's never to be without an interpretation given by the Holy Spirit. That's why any time, and and many of you, if you've been a part of the church, you may have been in a service where that's happened. But we pray through those things because we don't believe it's just to be, well, I'm going to get there in a moment. Interpretation of tongues. This gift allows the gift of tongues to be a benefit for those other than the speaker. As they are able to hear and agree with whoever's speaking in tongues the words to God. They'll, they'll give an interpretation. And we always, as a church, we, we, we don't try to complicate it. We're not, we're not trying to detract. We get up and we pastor the moment and go right to Scripture of this is what's happened. Why? Because when these gifts are publicly exhibited, even if it's a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge, we believe that it all has to come back to Jesus. It's never about a person. It's about the the active work of God and His Holy Spirit that He may be exalted. Scripture talks about when a message in tongues is to edify the body. It's to lift up. That's why God's purpose is for the interpretation to be there. But handling spiritual gifts is like handling dynamite. Dynamis is actually the Greek word for power often used when referring to the Holy Spirit. When used rightly, the gifts are explosively loving. That's where Paul says, follow the way of love and eagerly seek the gifts of the Spirit. When used wrongly, they are explosively destructive. And here's the challenge and the tension, is it's tempting for believers and churches just not to use them at all. Think if I, if I had a bunch of sticks of dynamite, some of you may be brave enough to grab hold of a stick, but most of us are like, whoa, Pastor! What are you doing? And so a lot of people, believers, Christians, churches, just say, hey, that looks dangerous. I'm just going to walk away. And can I tell you that early Christians also felt this way at times, dealing with damaging experience. I, I, I believe this is why Paul had to say things like, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Why? Because it's tempting just to say, hey, that's a little messy. Hey, we don't, we don't fully understand that, and so we're just going to back away from it. No, we want to say, God, we want to be better stewards of the activity of your Holy Spirit. So we're going to pray. We have to discern what is of God and what is not of God. And as gatekeepers, I, as shepherds, we believe that the Holy Spirit is moving. And so when you say, yes, I'm a part of Greenville First, it may be a little messy sometimes. Because I'm the first to say, I haven't figured everything out. But I can promise you every day I am seeking for more of the Spirit and less of me. That I will lean in and live a Spirit-filled life that is in step with the Spirit. That is eagerly seeking the activity and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
And can I tell you, these are not suggestions. These are actually commands. That God has purposes for these gifts that make them more than worth the danger. So what does seeking the gifts look like? Well, what do you do when you really want something? You don't wait around for someone else to figure out that you want it. Most of us probably have prime subscriptions that the moment somebody gives you just roughly an idea of, well, that would be neat if we had something like that. You've already found somebody who invented it and and it can be delivered to your house within two days. But you start going after it. You pursue it. You start asking questions if, if you're an individual, and, and I won't call names of friends in the room, but if you're like me, we, we, if, I'm, if I'm buying new technology, I'm making sure that I've, I've evaluated everything, every review. I don't want to make bad decisions. I'm going to do every bit of research, then I'm going to get it all together. I'm going to watch YouTube videos. That works. So you know what I think this looks like for us to eagerly seek the gifts? I think we start with the Bible. We start digging. Read Acts. Read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Sit down and ask questions. There are so many saints in the room. Our staff, our board. We'd love to answer any question that you may have when it regards to you seeking the Holy Spirit, the gifts that the Spirit has for you. And then I just wrote my note, pray, 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 seek first His kingdom. And all these things will be added unto you. Spirit-filled life keeps in step with the Spirit, desires gifts of the Spirit. But I also think we have to ask this question today. What if my life isn't producing fruit? What if my life is not producing fruit? I think we have to repent. Because if my life's not producing fruit, then that means I'm not living in the fullness of what God intends for my life. When the flesh is winning, we have to go to repentance in order to move forward in holiness. We have to request. I think we have to ask of God. If we're going to bear the fruit of holiness, then we need to ask Him, the one who provides His Holy Spirit for us, ask for more of His Spirit. And then we have to renew. We have to put our eyes on Jesus and pursue His Holy Spirit. One author said this, when we put our eyes on Jesus, here we find our fruitful vine. And I want you to hear Our Lord of love, our joyful king, our prince of peace, our patient master, our kind friend, our good God, our faithful savior, our gentle shepherd, our brother who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet with perfect self-control. Put your eyes on Jesus. He's not provided us a list of fruit that He hasn't lived out in His nature. Now here's the reality. We look at this and the bad news, we can't obtain it on our own. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it in our own strength. I don't care how good you try to be. That's the bad news. The bad news is that in our sin, we are separated from God. But the good news, the greatest news that we'll ever hear, ever experience is that Jesus came and gave his life to be the way, the truth, the path to eternal life. And then he said, I'm leaving so that one greater than I can come, the comforter, the helper, the leader, the guide, or the Holy Spirit. So today, you may be sitting here and say, Pastor, if you only knew my past, you know that I can't produce the fruit. Like I, I'm not even a bush right now. <laughs> like I don't even have leaves, Pastor. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. Don't take this message as it's, oh, well, I got to pursue these fruits and I got to pursue these gifts. And no, choose Jesus. Lean in and be led by His 
spirit. I'm going to invite everybody to bow your head and close your eyes today. If you're here in the room and you just say, Pastor, that's me. I need to make a decision to follow Jesus. I'm ready to say yes to him. My life is a mess. My life isn't where it's supposed to be. I'm not producing fruit. I'm not anywhere close. I need Jesus to rescue me right where I am. I'm just going to invite you to slip your hand up. Nobody's looking. You're in the room. You just say, hey, I need Jesus. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Thank you. Anybody else in the room? You say, I need Jesus today. I'm ready to make that decision. If you're online, we're going to give you some instructions in just a moment. But I'm going to invite everybody just to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. And I want to be made new. I invite you into my life. I want to trust you as my Savior. And follow you as King. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we celebrate those who made a decision to follow Jesus today?